Good morning everyone, welcome to the Vineyard Church in Harrogate. I'm Maggie and this is Nick and we lead this lovely church together. It's really great to have you joining us. We've got a few notices and then Nick is going to lead us in worship and Steve will be sharing this week's sermon based on one of the biblical stories of encountering Jesus. Great. Uh, and also we're going to have our virtual coffee and chat over Zoom straight after the service. So we'll share the link in the Facebook comments at the end. So please do jump on with that. Uh, quick notice for parents and youth. Um, as a lot of the young people have parents' evening this week, uh, our youth Zoom meetup is now going to be a week on Thursday on the 1st of April. And don't forget that next weekend is when the clocks spring forward, which sounds really positive, but unfortunately it's the one where we lose an hour's sleep. But we'll still be online at 10.30am, so don't forget to change your clocks. Yes, indeed. Oh man, do you know, I just get so confused with all the clock changing <laughs> and so stressed by it all. It really does. But um, today marks a year Gosh. since we started online services. Crikey, I can't wow. believe it's been a whole year. We were remembering the panic that we had <laughs> when we learned on the Friday before that we couldn't meet in person at St Aidan's that Sunday. Yeah. And then trying to make sure that we could still connect with you all, getting a little tripod for our camera, <laughs> trying out Facebook Live. It was really Let's be honest, it was, it was really bad. So um, in <laughs> fact, um, we, we've been back through some videos and in fact, uh, this was our first attempt on the Saturday before that Sunday uh, when we put up an invite video to our first online service and we really wanted to share it with you and we only realised afterwards that it was sideways. We'd love to invite you to our first online service that will be tomorrow morning, Sunday the 22nd at 11am. <laughs> oh my goodness, I know it gave everyone a laugh, but I am so glad that we found out the day before and we managed to work out how to turn the camera around. Oh Ab dear. Absolutely. <laughs> we are so thankful to you, our wonderful church community, at how you've stuck with us through all the challenges and trials of lockdown. We thought it might be funny uh, to see some of our Sunday bloopers from our rehearsals and from our live streaming from the pod. So, mm. run VT! Good morning, welcome to us doing our Harrogate Vineyard service. Yeah, I got confused then because you stole my bit, so apparently you're Maggie, which That's is always true. nice. Indeed, um, and welcome. Let's see if the guitar sounds out. Good morning, uh, welcome to Harrogate. Oh, I don't know what happened, sorry. Um, it was a day of marriages yesterday. Uh, we said goodbye to Rachel. <coughs> so, back by popular demand. <laughs> I did clap, you're right. That was good. <laughs> stop, stop recording. I think I came out of those worse than you. I don't know. I, I think it's totally true that I can't seem to start saying anything without clapping. <laughs> I can't stop myself from doing it. It's a strange one. Although I think my personal favourite is the one where you seem to be terrified by the side of my face. I couldn't work out whether it's I've got a scary looking ear or my beard or something like that. I, I genuinely don't know what it was. It was just scary. Anyway, we should uh, we should probably move on and celebrate that we are now totally slick. Super slick. Super slick. Absolutely. Yep. So um, anyway, uh, don't forget that we have our virtual coffee. I just clapped. Don't forget that we have our virtual coffee and chat over Zoom after Steve's talk, and uh, we'll post the link in the comments. Please join us for a few minutes just to catch up. Um, but Nick, would you lead us in worship this morning? Yeah, of course. Uh, so let's pray. Let's pray. Um, calm Holy Spirit, we welcome you to draw nearer to us, wherever we are. In whatever circumstance that we're in, we need your presence. We need your peace and we need your healing power. Mm. So come draw nearer to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We wait and hope for you. Shelter and our truth, for you are always faithful to your word. Consume our hearts and minds, be the 
author of this life Your kingdom come Your will be done In these times of doubt and sorrow
for your presence. We thank you that you draw nearer to us, that you meet with us, that you know us and you love us. Thank you so much, Jesus.
Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I want you more and more. You've lifted my burden. So I can come closer than ever before. Come, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God with us. You are God. can we say but thank you Lord thank you that you know each one of us you know our burdens you know our challenges you know where we fall short and you love us wholeheartedly and you gave up everything for us so that we would know peace we would know love we would know hope even in the midst of our darkest circumstance so we thank you and we pray Lord, that you would move in our hearts even now as we focus on you. And we thank you in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. So uh, thank you for worshipping along with me. And uh, now over to you, Steve. Good morning. I hope you are feeling well. And I hope you're able today to not only be encouraged in your physical life, but in your spiritual life as well. My name is Steve. For those who don't know me, I'm the assistant pastor here at Harrogate Vineyard Church. And before we go any further, let's take a moment and pray and ask God to guide these words and also to guide each of us in hearing what he has to say through this. Father, we love you. We praise you. We yield our lives to you this morning and ask you to guide our thoughts, guide what we hear, and guide how we respond in our hearts. Help us to walk well with you in obedience and love, and we praise you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been in a series now for a couple of months on encountering Jesus, looking at people in the New Testament who encountered Jesus and the impact that encounter had on their lives. We've looked at people like Simeon and Anna who uh, encountered Jesus when he was just a baby and were impacted by that. We've looked at individuals uh, who had a deep need for Jesus, uh, who reached out to him, like the woman who had been struggling with a health issue for 12 years and who reached out in a crowd and touched the edge of his garment and was healed instantly. We've looked at people whose uh, friends had the faith and courage to bring them to Jesus uh, on their behalf. We've looked at people who were called by Jesus to walk with him, uh, like Levi that Judith talked about last week, people who walked with Jesus for years and were impacted by that. All of these people had life-changing encounters with Jesus. Today, we're going to talk about someone who had a profoundly life-changing experience with Jesus before he and Jesus actually ever met. Uh, this man, according to the cultural rules of that day, uh, actually would have been thought of as Jesus' enemy. But instead, he was a man of deep humility and love, a man of faith. From an earthly point of view, he was a man who had tremendous power, wealth, authority, but he absolutely humbled himself in the way he reached out to Jesus, and he rightly treated Jesus as the one who had the true power and authority. This man was not Jewish. He was a career army officer in the Roman army, serving with the uh, Roman legion there in Judea, in Galilee, a centurion stationed in the town of Capernaum with the task of keeping this conquered people, these Jews, under control. That doesn't sound like a very good starting place for a relationship with Jesus, since Jesus was obviously Jewish. And yet this man was one of only two people in the entire New Testament who so impressed Jesus with their faith 
that Jesus referred to them as having great faith. In addition to talking about this man's faith this morning, I also want to talk about his humility, his absolutely stunning humility. As I dug into this story, and as I tried to understand what was going on, I was actually shocked at this man's humility. He was one of the most powerful men in Capernaum, possibly the most powerful man in Capernaum, from the human point of view of power and authority. And yet, um, he didn't act that way. Based on what was going on in that area geographically in the first century, he should have been the most hated man in Capernaum. As a career army officer, he was dedicated to maintaining and expanding the power and control of the Roman Empire. In his position, he represented military oppression. He represented harshness, the harshness of a conquering foreign army. And if nothing else, he would have been hated by everyone in that area simply because he represented higher taxes. He should have been hated, but he was loved and honored by the Jews of Capernaum. Why? What made this man who he was? Let's read the beginning of this story in the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Luke. I'm reading in the NIV UK. We're going to read Luke chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was ill and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. All right, let's pause there for a moment. Leading up to this point in the story, Jesus has been outside of Capernaum, and he's been preaching through a series of messages. He had just finished and was walking back into town with his disciples. They had an entire crowd of people following them, and then some local Jewish leaders came rushing up to Jesus with a request. I can't think of any other place in Scripture where the leaders of the local Jewish population came to Jesus asking a favor on behalf of a Roman army officer. This is more than just a bit unusual. This is rare. As I mentioned before, the Jews hated the Romans, but they didn't hate this guy. What was different about this army officer? In verse 2 we read, there, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was ill and about to die. Right away, we know a couple of important things about this military officer. First, we know that he valued his servant highly. In the first century, in a conquered territory, a Roman army officer would have simply thought of his servants as if they were tools, sort of at the same level as an ox or a donkey. A sick servant would likely have been discarded, similar to the way a sick farm animal would have been discarded. So this army officer was a man who valued and cared for people that others might have treated as worthless or subhuman. Secondly, this Roman officer not only cared deeply for this servant, but he was humble enough to do whatever he could to help this servant without worrying about his reputation or what people thought of him. So I want to make some observations. This is observation number one. This army officer cared for and helped those that others would have ignored or discarded. Let's go on with the story. At this point, the officer reached out to the local Jewish leadership for help. Did he coerce them? Did he force them? Let's read verses 3 to 5. Luke chapter 7, verses 3 to 5. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. There's no sign of coercion here. These Jewish leaders cared deeply about helping this Roman officer. They wanted fervently for Jesus to come to his aid. 
Normally, civic and religious leaders of the Jews in the first century would have wanted nothing to do with a Roman army officer. But these Jewish leaders not only did what he asked, they pleaded earnestly with Jesus on this man's behalf. They honored this officer with honest, heartfelt praise and talked about how he loved the Jews and did good things for them. This officer was a good man, a humble man, a man who was greatly appreciated by those around him. So let me make my second observation. In addition to saying that this army officer cared for and helped those that others would have ignored or discarded, we can also say that this army officer was cared for and helped by those who could have hated and ignored him. All right, let's continue the story. Uh, Luke chapter 7, let's read verses 6 and 7. So Jesus went with him. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. Think about that. The most powerful man in town, who could have sent soldiers to drag Jesus in front of him with clubs and swords, instead sent a message to this homeless traveling teacher saying, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. This rich, powerful man is saying to this penniless, conquered Jew, I am not worthy, you are worthy. There's also probably an element of cultural sensitivity here. Jews would normally have been very hesitant to enter the home of a Roman. They would have become unclean. So this officer was also being culturally sensitive to that issue and choosing not to put Jesus in the awkward position of having to enter a Roman home. This officer was both considerate and humble. So let me make my third observation. Observation number three. This man, at the top of the social ladder, humbled himself before someone at the bottom of the social ladder. Continuing on, this officer's amazing humility was matched by his amazing faith. He said to Jesus, Say the word, and my servant will be healed. This message was delivered publicly, so there was no taking it back, no hedging his bets, he sent a public message stating plainly that he had complete confidence in this teacher that he had never even met. In verse 9, the officer explains why he had this confidence in Jesus. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. This officer recognized that Jesus had tremendous power and authority in the spiritual realm, which leads to observation number four. This officer had the faith to understand and emphasize the spiritual realm over the physical realm. Let's read the last two verses of this story, verses 9 and 10. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Think about that. It's wonderful that the servant was healed, but the shocker here is that Jesus was amazed by this Roman army officer. How often do you read in the New Testament that Jesus was amazed? Wouldn't you want to be the person who amazed Jesus with your love, your generosity, your humility, your faith? This Roman army officer is such an example to us. He was a man who cared for and served others well, even the outcasts of society. He was a man who was humble, considerate, 
and generous and gave of himself freely. He was a man who put more emphasis on the spiritual than on the physical. So based on that, here's my encouragement to all of us this week. Number one, let's love and care for those around us, especially those that society ignores or rejects. Number two, instead of clinging to status or reputation, let's give ourselves freely to others. <clears throat> and number three, let's emphasize the spiritual realm over the physical realm and trust Jesus. I want to make one more observation. The basis for this story is that this Roman army officer, this centurion, had a problem that he could not solve. This servant that he loved and valued was sick and was about to die, and that was a fact. It's when we have a problem that we can't solve that we turn to God. So if you have a problem that you can't solve, take it to Jesus. Instead of being angry with God, choose instead to see it as an invitation. An invitation into a spiritual story where you get to express your love, humility, and faith. And Jesus gets to be the one who meets your need in his way, in his time. So again, if you're facing a problem that you can't solve, take it to Jesus. Thank you for being with us today. If you have some questions or would like to talk with someone, please contact us. You can find our contact info on the church website, harrogatevineyard.org.uk. May you be blessed and encouraged, and may you take your problems to Jesus. And may I take my problems to Jesus. We look forward to connecting with you again next week. Have a great day.